Amen. First Peter chapter four, verse seventeen through nineteen. If Christians suffer now for doing good, what will the unsafe suffer for their ungodly deeds? Let me say that again. And I mean to bring light to this truth that as Christians, we suffer now in this earth for doing good, for standing up for what is right according to the Bible. But what will the unsaved suffer for their ungodly deeds? What will be their suffering? See, our suffering as believers is now on earth. When we leave this earth, we will live eternally with God in glory where there is no more tear, no more suffering, and no more pain. So the worst for us, guys, is here on earth. What's waiting us is awesome. But the suffering that is brought upon God's people and children and the world by the unbelieving, their suffering is, is just the beginning here on earth. Because after they leave this earth, they go to another suffering a type of separation from God that will last eternity. And that's what I'm here to warn you about, those of you that do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, is that there is judgment coming. And it's awaiting all those who do not know Jesus Christ. And my heart is is that you would come to know Him, love Him, serve Him, and that you would have suffering now, as we all do, but have glory then that is awaiting all of us. Peter is going to talk about the suffering of the believers. Last time we met, which is a couple of weeks ago, we left off at verses 12 through 16. So let me read those just to give us the context of what Peter is talking about. Um, And then I'll share a couple other scriptures too. It says in verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning fiery trials, which is to try you, as though some strange things happen to you. So fiery trials are going to come. What are trials? They're just struggles in life. Uh, Sufferings in our relationships with one another, you know, financial struggles. Persecution if you're a believer because you stand up for righteousness. Right now they're they're persecuting the church because we are saying that homosexuality is a sin in God's eyes. And so that's a big no-no to the world because the world says we can't judge people and we shouldn't judge people, but God's Word has already judged uh, that truth. And so that's a big issue. Churches are being forced to close down because they're believing what the Word of God says. Canada, there's a law. And they're literally putting pastors in prison because they're preaching that message. That's the world. That's the unbelievers. And and there's persecution upon the unbelievers. That's not even including what's happening in third world countries with the Muslims who are persecuting Christians. They're literally taking Christians out of their homes, taking the husband and beheading him in front of his family and telling the rest of them to... um, reject Christianity, and to accept Muslims. They're taking their daughters and they are marrying them legally in the Muslims' eyes and then divorcing them and passing them around to the other men that are Muslim. This is what's going on today. There is persecution. There is suffering out there in the world. And Peter's saying, don't think it's strange because it's happening. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Then in verse 15 he says, But let none of you suffer as murderers, thieves, evildoers, or even busybodies in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. So if we are to suffer as believers, let us suffer for righteous sake and not for ungodliness. The believing world thinks that I can have a gay pride parade in downtown San Francisco and if there are Christians on the sidelines protesting, they feel like they're being persecuted and judged. That's unrighteous judgment in the eyes of God. In the sense that it is unrighteous in their eyes. It's it's something that is warranted because they're sinning against God. But yet, if a Christian says something against them, they can be put into jail. That's judgment that's coming upon them because they're standing up for God. And I know in this day and age, I know probably even in this room, that some of us have bought the lie in the world that uh, these sins are okay. 
and that we need to not judge people on their moral values and the issues that they're dealing with. And so Peter is talking to believers who are being beheaded, who are being crucified, who are dying, fathers in front of their children, mothers in front of their children, who Nero is persecuting, and he is encouraging them through this little letter. He's encouraging them in grace. If you look at chapter 5, at the end there, he says, I have written to you briefly, this is the reason why he has written to us, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God which is which you should stand. So first he's exhorting, these believers, they're being persecuted. They're being wounded. They're hurting. And yes, yet he's exhorting them. He's encouraging them. He's strengthening them. That's his heart as a pastor, is to encourage and strengthen them while they're walking in this world. Yeah, I know you just lost your dad. Keep going. Hang on. Christ is coming back. Don't look at the world. Don't look back. Don't turn away. God is still in control. Just keep going forward. That's how he's in exhorting them to move forward and don't let the world bring you down. Also, he's testifying of the true grace, the true favor of God, the grace of God. Peter is the fifth letter in the gospel to use the word grace more than any other letters. Corinthians uses it 20 times. Peter uses it eight times. A small little epistle of five chapters, Corinthians has something like 15, 16 chapters, 20 times. Peter uses it eight times. How important is grace? It's important to Peter. What is grace? It's God's favor, and it's unmerited. See, this is God's grace, that he has offered mankind salvation through the work of his son Jesus Christ on the cross. And that all mankind needs to do is believe in Jesus Christ and what He has done, and God will have favor on them. He will wipe away the punishment of their sin and give them access to heaven. It's that simple. That's what grace does. Grace even extends beyond that. Once you accept that, and you're saying, I want Christ in my heart, can't do it on my own, it's a struggle, I'm going through all kinds of sufferings and pain and so forth, and I need help from God Almighty. And I believe that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6 says that. And there's no other way to the Father except through Him, He said. And so I believe that, so I believe it, I take it. I want to live for Him now. That's the next step, sanctification. The works that we do are not works of salvation. They are works because we love God and we're appreciative of what He's done. And so then we work for Him, we serve Him because He's saved us. It's not the works that save us, though. It's what He did on the cross that saves us. And Christians get that mixed up. We need to understand the grace of God. It is God's favor on us. But then once that favor is received, then we need to do something for Him in response. In other words, to show that we are appreciative and that we have accepted Him in our hearts. We become fruitful, is what the Bible says. And if you plant an orange tree in your garden, you should get what? Avocados? No, you should get oranges. And so if you receive Christ in your life, you should have fruit. What kind of fruit? Righteous fruit, godly fruit, the fruit that the Bible talks about. That's the kind of fruit that he's talking about. So he's talking about God's grace. So here's the church suffering, and Peter's saying, I encourage you in God's grace and His favor. Look, He saved you by His favor, so continue on in His favor. But we're dying, Peter. Our children are dying. I understand, and they're going straight to heaven where there is no more suffering, there is no more pain. Because they're righteous, because they're godly, because they stood up. So hang on, and I encourage you and exhort you to keep going forward. And he's writing to the church that is dispersed there in Pontus, in the area of modern-day Turkey. The theme of my message today is the wounded. The wounded. We've all been wounded in one way or another. Whether in our relationships, whether at work or home, where there's a community, a friend. We've been wounded in some way or another. We've been wounded in different ways in that people have literally attacked us or oftentimes we wound ourselves because of our decision making. How many times have you stubbed your toe? You ever walk? It seems like it happens more as you get older than when you were younger. But you walk by the door and boom, you stub your toe on the door like, how did that happen? And you got this bloody toe. You wound yourself. How many times do we wound ourselves? Because we open up ourselves to those type of wounds. I'm here to say that there's healing in God and in Jesus Christ. If we are willing to humble ourselves before Him and allow Him to heal us. See, God loves you. Jesus died on the cross for you. And He came to embrace you 
and, and to pour His love and grace upon you. That's His heart. That's His desire. And no other desire does He have but to bless you. If you think that God is wounding you and that God is against you, you're wrong. That's a lie of the enemy. And He's trying to keep you away from God. See, God will only allow things in your life that will draw you to Him, not push you away from Him. The enemy will bring things to your life to push you away from God and not draw you to God. And that's the enemy. And we need to be aware of that. And so, the theme, the wounded. And there's healing in Christ. So let's look at verse 17. Um, Peter starts off with a time of cleaning house. It starts with the church. It starts with the church. Cleaning house. Let's look at the church first. Uh, and let's see what the church is doing. How is it doing? What can we improve on? How can we grow? How can we get through various situations? You know, kind of spring cleaning. We all like spring cleaning, right? Guys love spring cleaning. No, guys don't like spring cleaning. I don't think even ladies love spring cleaning. But we have to spring clean, right? Because the dust and the windows from the rain get, you know, kind of leave their little marks on the, on the glass and they get dirty and, and so forth. And we're getting for, ready for summer. Otherwise, we leave it and there's cobwebs and there's spiders and you reach down and there's a black widow or various things, you know, if you don't spring clean. Yet spring cleaning is difficult, but we need to spring clean. And usually we spring clean our own homes, right? You don't go to someone else's home, do you? If you do, let me know. <laughs> you know? You come to my house <laughs> and help. No, uh, we usually clean our own homes. We spring clean our own homes. And so in a sense, God is saying here, it's time to clean our own house. You know, it starts with us first. So he says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. The word house of God is a metaphor for the church of Christ, which is, which is composed of all believers from all races from all over the world. And so, the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And this is not necessarily eternal judgment. This is, could be correction, chastisement, you know, directing it from God's perspective. And it starts with the house of God, the church first. We need to look at ourselves as a body of Christ in the community. In the world, the church, and throughout the different nations, and then the cities, and then the communities, and then us individually too. It always starts with us. Whenever we judge, oftentimes we judge by looking at others and not at ourselves. I remember the old, uh, old analogy that someone gave me one day when I, when I pointed a finger at someone. They said, you know, when you point a finger, guess what? Three others are pointing at you. you know, they're pointing right at you when you do the one pointing. And so we need to look at ourselves first. And that's what Peter is saying here, is that look at yourselves. So when God's house, His church is judged with burning fire, it's for a purpose, it's for testing, for proving, for purifying the church. God is hoping to make us holy as He is holy, to make us pure as He is pure. That's His purpose for us gathering together to equip one another in the work of the ministry so that we can be pure and effective to reach the lost in this community. He purifies us. He allows us to go through suffering. Though we don't like it, we would rather have no suffering and a prosperous life than have suffering. But suffering's good. It helps us appreciate God. And one that knows what chronic suffering is about, I know that I need God even more than if I didn't have the suffering. I remember being perfectly healthy without any chronic pain. And it seemed like I didn't need to depend on God as much as I need to depend on Him now. Because now it's, it's every day there's pain when I wake up in the morning. And, and every day I'm asking, Lord, help me to get through today. Just today. Because if I think about next week or the week after, it gets depressing. I have to think about today. Just through this service till 1 o'clock and then I'll hit my bed you know, again, and just start getting ready for the next day you know, type of thing. We need God in our lives, and it begins with us for a good reason. So we should always look at ourselves. Second Corinthians 13, 5, 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? And so we're to examine ourselves. We're to test ourselves. We're to know ourselves. I think we need to know ourselves more than we need to know about others. We're too busy asking questions about others when we should be asking questions about ourselves. The next time you make a judgment call, the next time you complain about something, 
Look at your own life first and say, okay, have I complained about that? Because I do that quite often. I'll say, but they're doing it. And then I realize, oh, man, I do that too. So, okay, I'm not going to judge it. I have to look at myself first and see if I'm at fault there too. C.S. Lewis said, a proud man always looks down on things and people. A proud person always looks down on things and people. That's a proud heart because he's looking at others. He says, of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. As long as you're looking down, you'll never see God. See, we need to look up and we need to trust in God and know that He's going to take care of everything as we examine ourselves. It's easy to convince ourselves that it's the other person's fault. It's their sins. It's the government that we have. It's this and that. But in reality, it's our sin. And we need to deal with that first. So Peter continues on with that same thought. It says, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? If judgment begins with us first, then what kind of judgment will come to those that don't obey God's word? What kind of judgment will they have? The church is ripe for judgment. No doubt about that. The church is guilty today. Um, I just read that uh, Jars of Clay, how many of you know that group? The lead singer just came out and said there's nothing wrong with same-sex marriage. This, this is a leader of a Christian band who's saying it's okay. And recently to um, Mariah Carey, the singer. The, huh? Carrie Underwood. Carrie Underwood. I know well, Mariah Carey is a whole different, <laughs> that's even worse, that's even worse. But it's worse that Carrie Underwood came out and said same-sex marriage is okay, we should leave it alone. These are Christians that are in the light and they are leading the church and they are deceiving the church. They're confusing the church, they're confusing the world too. Because the world's looking at us going, they can't even decide what they believe in. Jars of Clay, I was just reading an article. Um, someone posted it to me after I mentioned it at the first service. The guy went on to say that the reason that he believes that is because no one has given him a valid argument against it. I'm like, what? How about God and what he said in Romans chapter 1? Why don't you read your Bible, dude? I, I'm sorry. I got a little upset there. It's like, it's right there. Just read your word. No one? Look to God. I wouldn't look to anybody. I don't trust what anyone says. I want to hear what God has to say, and then I believe that. But it's sad because the church is ripe for judgment. You have churches that are preaching messages that are convenient, that teach on tolerance. We don't want to offend you, so we won't talk about sin. We won't talk about things that you're doing because then it might offend you and you might leave, you know, and we don't want you to leave, so we want you to stay even though it's under pretense. You know, no, we want you to know the truth. And yet churches are teaching that. They're teaching things like you can be wealthy, you can be prosperous. And that's their whole motive uh, uh, of having a church is to be prosperous and wealthy. You know that churches will literally go to a community and they'll reach out, spend a lot of money to reach out, get people in, they bring money in. And then once they've tapped out, they'll move that church to another community and those that are faithful will follow them and they'll reach out in that community, try to draw as much resources and then they'll move again until they get big enough. And all they're really looking for is resources, money to come in. They're not looking to be called to a place so they could reach lost souls. See, we're called here to this community. We're the only Calvary Chapel here in this little community. Other churches are called to other places, you know, and usually they're nicer places. I'd love that, and that'd be wonderful. And we try to reach out there every once in a while, but we're called here to this place, and it's a poor place. They don't have a lot of resources, and that's why we depend upon God to take care of our needs, and He does, and He's faithful. But this is where God has me. Pastors often ask me, how long have you been in that community? And I tell them, 19 years, and they go, 19 years? I go, yeah. Like, wow, that's a long time. Because that's where God's called me. I'm not going anywhere else until he says it very clearly. And we have seen people from the community here saved. Even if one soul gets saved, it's worth it. Jeremiah preached the gospel. No one ever got saved. And yet he was called to preach to the Israelites. And so we're reaching this community. Other churches are doing it for different reasons. The church is in a mess. 
This is what C.H. Spurgeon said. This would be the first step in apostasy. Apostasy means that they're falling away from the Bible, from the truth. And they're following the trend of the world. So this is the first step of apostasy. Men first forget the truth. They forget the truth. Jars of clay. No one's ever given me enough proof so that I can make a good decision. So they forget the truth. They're not coming back to the Bible because the Bible isn't the truth. The Bible is irrelevant today. No, it's not. It's more relevant today than ever before. It's been around for almost 7,000 years. People say, no, 2,000 years when Christ came. No, 7,000 from the beginning, Genesis. It's the same word, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You know, it, it hasn't changed at all. And it's relevant for today. I live my life according to it, and I live a blessed life because of it compared to when I lived in the world. When I lived in the world, my life was messed up. I was partying, I was on drugs, I was taking coke, I was out there on Tuesday nights without my wife, we were out there with other, the opposite sex, with my friends, having a good time, I was making money, I was prosperous with with Southern California Edison, making over $80,000 a year, you know, hey, that's everything that the world would want, and I was dying. I come to Christianity and I have to give all of that up and make a third of that, and I love it. And I'm not out there drinking and taking coke and you know, cheating on my wife and doing all these things. And I love it. And I get to know people. I get to see people grow and watch them go through the same type of metamorphosis that God puts us through. And it's wonderful. I love this life better than that old life completely. Because that life was a waste of time. And I thought that it was what the American dream was all about. And it wasn't. It wasn't at all. See, we forget the truth. If you stick with the truth, then you will be okay. He goes on and says, and then they adore the false. They adore the false, Spurgeon said. So they embrace the false. Yes, I want to embrace homosexuality. It's pleasurable, so I will endure the false. Yes, I want to embrace the false doctrine of prosperity, so they embrace the false. Yes, I want to be uh, tolerant of everybody, so I embrace that falseness. Because tolerance is really not what... The liberals define it as. Tolerance is really defined as this. You have a belief. I have a belief. I respect your belief. You respect my belief. I don't change your belief. I'm not judging your belief. You don't judge my belief. You know, and we can get along and accept that. Tolerance, defined by liberals, is this. You have a belief. I have a belief. You better believe my belief because your belief is wrong. And if you're not tolerant of my belief, then you're wrong and we will put you in jail. That's their definition. And that's what they're doing to Christians. That's what they're doing to Christians. And it's just Christianity they're attacking. Read the news. It's right there. The evidence is clear. The evidence of the end is clear. The apostasy. Uh, It happened during the time of the Old Testament in Jeremiah 25, 29. God said, I begin to bring calamity on the city, which is called by my name. God judged the city first. His city, Jerusalem, Israel first. Before he judged the world. Isn't that what happened in Isaiah? We've been going through the book of Isaiah. And God used the nations to judge Israel. To take them captive. And once they were judging in captive. Then God began to judge the nations. Because they had his people in captivity. And that's what's happening here. That Paul is talk- or Peter is talking about. Is God starts with us first. And then he will start with the rest of the world. So how much worse will it be for those who do not obey The word of God is clearly stated here exactly what Peter's thoughts are. He goes on and he says, Now, if the righteous, that is the godly who accept Christ, one is scarcely saved or hardly or barely or with difficulty is saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? So the question, and it's a rhetorical question because the obvious answer is there. Separation from God for eternity for the ungodly. So if the righteous are barely saved, and we know that to be true because Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Jesus is clear that destruction is a wide area. In other words, you can believe whatever you want, but it's all leading to destruction. If you believe that Mormonism is the way, if you believe Jehovah's Witness is the way, if you believe that, that uh, Buddhism, Islam, whatever other, if you believe angels is the way, I just, 
saw a, a documentary about somebody who just uh, thought up a new religion, and it's with that famous singer, not Mariah Carey, but the other one, Beyonce. And they, it, it's a new cult that's just started, and it, it's got her name in it. And it's that she's the goddess, and now they're putting their faith and trust in her because she's perfect. It's a new religion, and they're trying now to get their nonprofit um, status in the whole bit. So, hey, new religion, if you believe that way. God, Jesus says all those ways really lead to destruction. And this is what he said about Christianity. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Isn't that sad? I mean, it's so simple. Christ died on the cross for us. He has favor on us if we give him our lives and then we live our lives for him. It's that simple, but few find that. And they want to live their life in the world. So wherein the right unrighteous will be judged eternally, wherein the righteous will be living with God eternally. The same act of judgment that can be purifying and loving for believers will be punishment and wrath upon unbelievers. So Peter's point is that if the sinner who is declared righteous by faith is saved only with great difficulty, what will be the result of the ungodly? What will happen because of their disobedience? Paul draws a distinction between the earthly suffering and the saints of the endless punishment of lost in his writings. Jesus said, throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for the unrighteous. Revelation 21 8 says, cowardly, unbelieving, vile, murderers, sexual immorality, which includes homosexuality, those who practice magic art, the idolaters, all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And then Peter, in his second epistle, which we'll start in a couple of weeks, he says, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in gloomy dungeons, to be held for judgment. There were angels that when they sinned against God, you, you remember the story in Isaiah, Satan rebelled against God, took a third of the angels with him. There were angels that were so bad, God said, ah, you're not going anywhere. I've got to put you into the dungeons and lock you under key. Can you imagine if they were let loose? They were worse than the angels that were let loose. I can only imagine the stuff that they would have allowed or would have done while they were here upon this earth. It would have been really radical. He said, no, you're too bad. You're so bad, I'm going to lock you now. I'm not even waiting until judgment because of how wicked you are. See, there's a separation there, isn't there? Peter's making that separation between the righteous and the ungodly. There's a beautiful story found in Luke chapter 16, and we know it. The rich man and Lazarus, you remember the story? how the rich man had everything that he needed and Lazarus had sores and, and was homeless and just laid at the gates wondering and waiting for crumbs as the people would bring out the trash, you know, and food would fall. He'd grab it and he'd eat it and so forth. And so there you have a picture of the unrighteous and then you have the picture of the righteous. And here's this rich man with everything. And when they both die, you see the rich man in Hades, hell, separated from Abraham's bosom, which will lead to paradise. And you see the poor man there. So there's a distinction that Peter is making. And we know the outcome. We know the outcome that the rich man now is suffering for eternity. Compared to this life where the rich man is living pretty well. They're enjoying life. You know, and, and I say to you know what I say to them? You better enjoy it. You better enjoy your sin. You better enjoy your life. You better enjoy everything that you have because this is it after, after this life. Because you'll be in Hades for the rest of your life. Eternity. And what I say to the Christians, this is the worst it gets for you. So endure it. Fight through it. Trust in Christ. Because after this, boy, there's rest and there's peace and there's ultimate healing for all of our wounds. That's what Peter is saying here. Therefore, verse 19, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in what? In doing good as to a faithful creator. So his encouragement, look, if we're suffering, and we're suffering because of the will of God, according to his will, for righteous reasons, not because we wound ourselves, if you go to a church, and you're there gossiping, and, and you're there spreading rumors, 
and you're being a busybody, and you're talking about this person and that person, and then the church comes and says, you know, you're really causing division, and we need to ask you to leave. Oh, there we go. You're persecuting me. See, all of it is true. It's all your fault. See, that, that is, is not being persecuted for Christ's sake. That's your own wound. You've created that because of your attitude, because of your words, because of your heart's desire to be a busybody and be a divider. But if you're in the church and you're faithful to serve, and for some reason the pastor doesn't like you, you know, and he points you out and so forth, then that's righteous indignation. And they kick you out, then you can walk out there and say, thank you, Lord, you took me out of that place. I need to go to another place that might be a little bit better. We can cause wounds ourselves. We need to be careful. But there are those who cause wounds too. And I'm speaking to all of us, and we all have different types of wounds. You have wounds maybe that were brought upon you because you're a female and someone abused you or you're a male and somebody took advantage of you and there's wounds there and they're lasting and they're painful there's a lack of trust of men a lack of trust of women you don't want to get hurt again and I'm telling you that Jesus is the answer because he has healing for you it's all at the cross I don't have the answer I can only direct you to the one who who does have the answer and that's Jesus And when you give your life to him and you trust in him, he'll heal you. He will become your father. He'll become your husband. He'll become your friend. He'll be your everything. And he will take care of you. Just as he takes care of this church and provides for it, these big things that we need here, and he knows we have a need for them, he can also take care of us. That is a beautiful place to be. When God takes care of it and you didn't ask anybody. I'm corresponding with somebody right now from um, Nigeria, I believe it is. And he's been asking me as a pastor in a church for resources. Send me some money or Bibles you know, or other things. And I said, well, I'm not going to send you money because I just met you. I don't know who you are. You know, give me a Facebook page so I can see who you are and where you meet at and what kind of church you know, and so forth. And then I encourage him, pray to God. Just ask him to provide for you. If he's in it, he'll, he'll guide because where he guides, he provides too. And I told him the story about the asphalt here and the cement. And he was like, wow, that's great. But brother, if it's in your hands to do good, you need to do it. And I'm like, okay. So he's not getting the point. You know, I haven't done it yet. I'm just praying for him and creating this relationship. But see, do I want to have a church that is always asking and asking and then people give, but then we don't know if it's God doing it? I'm sure that there are those that are giving because they love God. They know their responsibility. They know they've been blessed by God. And so they want to be faithful to God as good stewards. I know there are those there. But oftentimes they're not. And sometimes they're giving by compulsion because they're forced to. And that shouldn't be the case either. Or do you want to go to a church where you're like, let's get together and just pray, God, you provide. And then all of a sudden he does. And then we all get to go, wow, God is so good to provide for us. And he does provide for us. See, it's God that we need to look to, not man. So in our wounds, in our hurts, in our pains, we bring them to him. Peter said in chapter 2, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Jesus cares for you. He loves you. He doesn't want to harm you. He wants good for you. And all he wants from you is to just cast those cares to him. Cast them on him. He goes, I'll take them. You have wounds, cast them. I'll take the wounds. I'll heal you. I'll take care of you. Because he loves you. We need to cast our cares upon him. Because he's a faithful creator. And Peter's encouraged them, look, you're suffering. I know your parents are dying. I know your children are being taken away. I know because of your Christian faith, continue on. Be faithful. Live in the grace of God. Don't stop from doing good. Don't stop from doing good. The tendency is that when we go through trials, when we're suffering, is to stop doing good. It doesn't work. I, I shouldn't be going to church anymore because it just does It seems like it's getting worse. Yeah, of course it's getting worse because the enemy's testing you. God is allowing it to see if you really believe or not. Or if the first trial that comes, you're going to run away. And a lot of people have. They run away at the first trial because their faith isn't strong. God's saying... Continue to do good. The Bible's clear on that. It speaks a lot about doing good. 
First Peter 2.15, he said, For such is the will of God. Such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of full of men. So doing right, living right, doing good works. You know, we love amusement parks more than anything else than doing good works. We'd rather enjoy life. And unfortunately, the church is sick because our church in America is worldly. It's a worldly church. Even in this community, as poor as it is, it's a worldly church. You know, because they have to have their iPhones. They have to have their video games. They have to have their big 50-inch screen TVs, you know, in their impoverished little room and house, you know, but they have all those things because that flesh desires those things. Did you know that the last Super Bowl, that 1.5 million Americans called in sick the next day because they had to see their Super Bowl? They had to party. And so the next morning, uh, 1.5 million, that's a lot of people calling in sick. You, know, you call your boss, I know why you're sick. See you tomorrow. They all expect it. You know. They say that uh, 4.4 million people are late to work the next day. Because we love our luxury. We're a worldly church. Let's just be honest. Examine ourselves. We're a worldly church. We think more about our needs than the church needs. We were radically uh, challenged on Wednesday night. We go through this book called um, Radical. And it's living a radical Christian life. And Jesus confronted this uh, rich young man. And he told the rich young man, give everything you have to the poor and come and follow me. That's radical, huh? Can you imagine Jesus asking you, would you be willing to give your house, cars, clothes, all your bank accounts, savings, investments to Jesus and follow me? Uh, (laughs) I don't think so. How about my car, my clothes, but not my investments, just in case I need it? Are you willing? That's a challenge. Now, he doesn't ask us all to do that, so don't worry. I'm not asking you to do that. But that's a radical challenge for this young man. And so in the book, it was challenging us, saying, what is Jesus asking you to give away? Maybe we need to take inventory, go look at our house and see, what do we have that's just sitting there and it's been there for 10 years? We haven't used it. Why don't we just give it away? Why don't we sell it and then use it for God's glory instead of allowing it to rust and rot and waste? Maybe he's challenging us in that way. What about your time? Maybe you're spending so much time over here. What about giving some of that time to the Lord? Challenging us to serve him and to do good. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And that's true. Not of works. At least anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We were created for good works. And so there are good works that need to take place in our lives. Now, I'm not saying it has to happen in the church, but maybe there's a ministry outside the church. And maybe you help people at a at a home or a community center, and that's what he's talking about. Be a light wherever you are at. 1 Corinthians 3, 7 tells us that we are God's fellow workers. We actually work with God. We work together in the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15.55 says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always looking for those opportunities. Now, why is Peter saying this? Here's where the relevance of the message is for us today. Because we all have wounds. We all have suffered. And Peter's encouraging us, don't let that stop you from being a light or being salt to the world. Let Christ shine through you. Even through the sufferings and the wounds. If you have someone out there that you need to forgive, forgive them. Let it go and let God handle them. If you have an area in your life, you need to confess it and you need to move on and start serving the Lord. I spoke to someone at the first service and this week was a horrific week for them. Their mother is, seems to be that she's dying and will be gone pretty soon. And then she finds out that her father, who has already passed, left, left them some land. And somehow this cultic church that they were involved in were able to take all the land from them. When the land was left to not just the mother and brother, but also to her and another couple of siblings, and they were never involved in it. You know, and so she's devastated. She's like, wow, just weeping. Pray for me. 
I don't know what to do. And I said, when did you find this out? Just the other day. Well, when did they do it? Seven years ago. The church took it from them. There's nothing you can do then. You just have to trust in Christ. Now, I didn't question her motives or anything like that, but you know, I said, as long as you're not looking just to get land and money, you know, which is, if that's your motive, then that might be why God allowed it to go. But if it's the injustice part of it, then you can do something about it. But you have to examine yourself. Is it because of the value of the money, and the wealth? Because money is money. It's going to perish. When we go from here to there, there's no more money. See, it's just how faithful we are with that money and what we do with it in God's kingdom. We can use it up all for ourselves. And I say, hey, if you want to use it all up for yourself, go ahead. Buy whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Enjoy whatever you want. When you get to heaven, you got nothing because it was never done for the kingdom of God. It didn't go to your account. But you enjoyed life, and that's fine too. It was temporal. But if you decide to take that and use it for God's glory, then when you get to the next place, God has rewards for you. And you have more than you can even imagine compared to this earth. That's the attitude that we should have. That's what Peter is saying here. That's what's the relevance of this message is all about. Yeah, we suffer. Yeah, we go through things. But keep doing good with what God has given us for his glory. So we should rejoice through these sufferings on earth because they're temporal compared to eternity. Let me close. We need to examine. We need to test. We need to know ourselves. Why do we do the things we do? Why are we hurting? Why don't we let go? Why don't we let God just take those things in our lives? Don't suffer needlessly. If you have control over it, then let it go and let God have it. If somebody is causing pain to you, then get somebody involved in it. You know, tell somebody. And I encourage, you know, the little children, if, if anybody causes pain to you, you tell your mom and dad right away. You tell the teachers right away because they will act on it. You let people know. Because these people are wise enough to say, if you tell, you're going to be in big trouble. And they'll convince them. And we need to warn our children of those things to protect them because we love them. So while we still have time, let us serve the Lord. <clears throat> let me close. Will you gladly suffer now? Will you gladly suffer now or reluctantly suffer for eternity? That You can reject Christ now, reluctantly, but suffering is coming either way. And I hope that you choose to ask Christ into your heart. I, I, I pray that you would choose to suffer now than suffer then. That you would have the perspective of, I want Christ now and what he has for me. And to be faithful with it. So that when I get there, there is no more suffering. There is no more pain. There is no more tears. Compared to, no, I want to just enjoy life now. And then get there. And Jesus look at you and say, depart from me. Because I don't know you. It's not what you want. And so your heart needs to change. And you need to make the choice to follow Christ through his word. And so I encourage you this morning to do so if you do not know Christ. To give your lives to Christ. Ask Him to come into your heart and then begin to live for Him by reading His Word. And He'll direct you. Believe me, He will direct you as you read His Word through His Holy Spirit. And those of us that are believers, that are wounded, hang on. Be encouraged. God is working. And He'll get you through. Joy is coming in the morning. A glorious day when we stand before Him. And He will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in to the kingdom. And that's what we want to hear. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the clarity and the truth that's found in it. Lord, that we don't have to cover it up or water it down or even beef it up, Lord God. We can just share what it says simply, Lord. Father, encourage your people, Lord. My heart goes out to those that are wounded, Lord, that you would bring healing to them, Lord. That you bring peace, Father. That peace that they can only find in Jesus and in no one else, Lord. Father, would you bring salvation to others, Lord? Prepare their hearts, Lord. Water the seeds that have been planted and plant the seeds, Lord God. And you bring the increase, Father, we pray, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.